Bienvenidos, Ushamdi, and welcome CTS 131 Section 875 students for the Spring 2018 semester at Anne Arundel Community College. This is the Routing and Switching Essentials Version 6 course from the Cisco Networking Academy, or the Networking 2 course at Anne Arundel Community College. And this morning's Packet Tracer tutorial and solution set is going to be on Packet Tracer Activity 6.4.1.2, where we're going to be tackling the skills integration challenge for chapter six. And this is actually a fantastic activity that's gonna have us really hone our skills here with router on a stick and more specifically, inner VLAN routing. So as you can see, we have our topology here on the left-hand side, our addressing table and our VLAN configuration over here on the right-hand side. So in this activity, you're gonna demonstrate and reinforce our ability to configure inner VLAN routing. Now, we're given some very general statements here, right? So this is really going to force us to think about what it is we're doing and making sure that we're capturing all of the key points here. So requirement number one, let's start right here. We're going to configure inner VLAN routing on router one based on the addressing table. And so if we focus here on router one in the addressing table, you can see that we've got quite a few sub-interfaces, one, two, three, four, five sub-interfaces. And then there's the serial interface here, which is connected to the HQ router, which is going to get us out of our environment over here to the ISP. So let's start here on router one. Let's bring router one up and let's give ourselves a little more room with which to work. And that should be good right there. All right, so let's dive in here. Now, we're in user exec mode, and that's evidenced by the greater than sign after the R1 hostname prompt. So let's go ahead and type enable to transition into privilege exec. And I'm going to start with a show IP interface brief because I want to see what we currently have configured. So the only interface that's currently configured is the serial 000 interface. Do I have connectivity to the other side of that serial interface. In other words, do I have connectivity over to the HQ router, uh, which isn't listed there, but should be dot one is my guess. And there you go. So we have connectivity on that side. However, it's on the southbound side, right? And it would be right here on gig zero zero on router one, where we need to do our inner VLAN routing work. So let's make that happen. Let's get into global config. And you can see that right now, gig00 is administratively down. Now, there's two ways we can approach this. I typically like to bring the interface up before I start configuring the sub-interfaces. But here's what we're going to do. I'm going to say interface gig00.10. And what we're going to do is we're going to wait and bring the parent interface up at the very, very end. So I'm into the sub-interface configuration mode. Now remember, if I'm in a rush here and I say IP address 172.31.10.1, and then I try to put the subnet mask on here and dot a decimal notation, if I hit enter, what's going to happen? Yeah, I'm going to get this gentle reminder here from iOS that's going to tell me that I noticed that you're trying to configure a sub-interface. However, in order to carve up this physical interface, gig00, into multiple virtual sub-interfaces, I need to know, you need to tell me how is it that I am supposed to differentiate among the traffic that's showing up on this physical interface. And this is where we can do 802.10, 802.1Q or ISL. And again, ISL is a legacy Cisco proprietary. It's actually deprecated. You won't even find ISL as an option in newer Cisco hardware. So we are definitely all about the IEEE 802.1Q trunking protocol. And that's how we're going to tackle this. So we want to say incap.1Q10. Now, another key reminder. Does the sub-interface number need to match the encapsulation.1Q number? And remember this. I'm, I can almost guarantee that at some point here in the near future, you will see something similar to this, where it's gig 00 0.7, but then it's encap.1Q, you know, 23 or so, you know, some other number. 
they do not have to match. And this is probably the number one thing that you'll, they'll try to trip you up on. So pay attention to that. The subinterface number and the incap.1q VLAN tag number do not need to match. What needs to match is the incap.1q tag number, right? And the VLAN for which this subinterface is functioning. So if it's VLAN 10, that needs to be .1q10. Excuse me, if it's VLAN 20, it needs to be incap.1q20. The subinterface is irrelevant. And again, as a final comment on this, you would be crazy not to match the subinterface with the incap.1q statement. It makes troubleshooting extremely difficult, especially if you have multiple subinterfaces. So we start with incap.1q110. Now I can add the IP address on here because now the router says, okay, you've told me how to differentiate it. I'm looking at .1q tags. Now I'll take the IP address. All right, so then we're going to get into interface gig 00.20, and we're just going to wash, rinse, and repeat here. incap.1q20 IP address, and I think it's going to be very similar here. Is it just the second, third octet? The third octet is different, right? So here we go. So then 20.1. And then we go into interface gigabit ethernet 00.30. I'm going to say incap.1q30. And then I'm going to pull the IP address back here, save myself a lot of typing. 172.31.30.1. So then we go into interface gigabit ethernet 00.88. And my guess is that, yeah, 99 is our native VLAN. And this is something that I historically overlook uh, for whatever reason but I'm not going to overlook it here because I noticed they had tons of uh, subinterfaces. So uh, let's get the IP address up. This is going to be 172.31, oops, sorry, 88.1. And now we come to the native VLAN. Remember, the native VLAN is here. For the, for the uh, unlikely event, in a modern network that traffic shows up on the trunk link with no tag, right? No VLAN tag. And so that's where the native VLAN comes into play. So we're going to say int gig 00 0.99. Now on the incap.1q99 statement, and this is typically what I forget here, is if I do a question mark at the end, you can see I can indicate and mark this as the native VLAN. In fact, if I don't, we are not going to get the points for it. So we're at 20 out of 82 right now. Uh, and we need to make sure we have native on there so that the router side of the trunk link knows, right? This subinterface knows that this is the native VLAN uh, interface. And yeah, it was worth four points right there to get that piece correct. All right. And so that is the native VLAN. Now, do show IP interface brief. What do we still have to do here? We have all of our subinterfaces configured. And actually, I should probably get an So I remember to do the VLAN tag for the native VLAN, and then I overlook the IP address. So always a good idea to double check. So you can see here we've got all of our subinterfaces. One, two, three, four, five. Let me double check. One, two, three, four, five. So everything looks good here, except take a look. Everybody is down. Right? So what if I get into interface gig 00 and I say no shut? And take a look at what happened there. Now all of the interfaces are up, up, right? So we bring the parent interface up and all of the child interfaces or the sub interfaces come up. And that is on router one, that is all we need to do for inner VLAN routing. So now we need to configure trunking on switch one. And you can see our spanning tree has completed there. So let's bring switch one to the four, give ourselves a little more room with which to work. And that should be good right there. We'll come to the CLI where we should be in user exec mode, right? That greater than sign, it's user exec mode. Enable gets us into privilege exec, which is that hash sign or the pound sign. So if I was to say, and it looks like it's gig zero one, if I said show IP interface brief, or how about show interface trunk first? Let's see, do we have any trunk ports? We do not, right? And we know that we need one. I'm going to say show run, and we're going to go all the way to the bottom here. So gig zero one is the port that we need to be a trunk port. If I was to say 
show um, interface gigabit ethernet 01 switch port. What mode, and here before I roll up there, what operational mode do you think gig 01 is going to be in right now? Did it negotiate as a trunk or is it static access, right? Remember that, that dynamic trunking protocol will try to negotiate right? If it can, it'll look to negotiate ISL, which again, deprecated, but you'll still find it on legacy equipment, uh, 802.1Q. And if it can't negotiate as a trunk, right? If it doesn't successfully become a trunk, the fallback is static access. And so right now we're a static access port and that is not what we want. So let's get into global config with configure terminal and let's go into interface gigabit ethernet 01. And it's here where we're going to say switch port mode trunk. Right? So we're going to hard code this port as a trunk port. I'm also going to turn DTP off. I'm going to say switch port, no negotiate. Now, the other thing I need to make sure that I do, and I can almost guarantee there are points tied to this, we have a native VLAN 99. So I need to make sure that I say switch port trunk native VLAN 99. And we're at 30 out of 82. I would be shocked if this does not get us a few points. Yeah, and in fact, that was a six-point um, swing right there to make sure that we get the native VLAN on here. So now let's take a look at Gig01, and we should see that we've got a much nicer looking config here. Switch port, no negotiate, so DTP is off. Switch port mode trunk, we've hard-coded it as a trunk port, and then we've got the trunk native VLAN 99. And that should be, let me take a quick look back over here, that should be everything. All right, so we're going to configure four directly attached static routes on HQ. Now, the reason we're doing all of these static routes is so that one, we understand how to do static routes, but we haven't gotten into the dynamic routing protocols uh, per se. We've talked a little bit about RIP, uh, but we're probably transitioning here. Uh, this is setting us up for a, tr a smooth transition into uh, OSPF and EIGRP, but we need to know how to do the statics. So configure four directly attached static routes on HQ to each VLAN 10, 20, 30, and 88, however, not 99. So we need to get the HQ router up here. And we're going to get some exercise with our static route creation. Now, remember, when you're thinking about static routes, right, and the syntax for the static route, think of it as my IP route to get to this network with this subnet is, and for directly connected, right, we're doing four directly attached static routes, it's going to be out this interface. So we're in user exec mode, let's use enable to get into privilege exec, and we'll use configure terminal to get into global config. Now we can see it's serial 000. Let's say do show IP interface brief. And that in fact is the IP that we pinged early on from router one. So here's what we're going to do. My IP route to get to the 172.31.10.0, right? Remember, it's the network, not to get to the IP address assigned to the subinterface. I want to get to this network. And again, what I'm saying here when I say with a subnet mask, not a wildcard mask, right? It's a subnet mask with a static route. What I'm saying is when I look into my routing table, I'm looking at that network and all 254 possible usable IPs that I can get to to make a determination as to if I have traffic that shows up on HQ trying to get to, let's say, 172.31.10.58, when it looks into its RIB, its routing information database, this is where it makes the determination, do I have a route for this destination IP? In other words, a routing statement that has a network that encompasses the destination IP that I see in the layer three IP header. And we do right here, but now I need to tell it out which interface because this is directly attached. So I'm gonna go out. And again, it's not the next hop IP address. That would be the IP on the router one serial 000 interface. What I'm saying is 
out which local interface do I have to go? And of course, we get this, uh, if not point-to-point -point interface. We've seen this before. Now, this is pretty simple from here on out, right? All I need to do is change the third octet and continue to create the directly connected static routes. And it's 10, 20, 30, and they wanted 88 and 88. And there we go. And you can see that we were awarded points for the static route creation. And everything was a slash 24, so that was very straightforward. So now when I say do show run, or actually do show IP route, we should see that I have four static routes, directly connected static routes. The outgoing interface is serial 000. And so if anything for the dot 10 dot 0 slash 24 dot 20 dot 30 dot 88, you get the idea. Any packet that shows up destined to an IP address that would fall within that network range, right, for each of those statics, is going to be delivered, and it's going to be pushed out the serial 00 interface, or forwarded out the serial 000 interface. Okay, now I'm going to configure directly attached static routes on HQ to reach outside host. And so here, whoops, here is the outside host, right, and you might not be able to see the mouse too well. So here's the outside host. Now, remember, they give us this subnet here. So the question is, it says to reach the outside host. Well, what they don't clarify is, do I need to reach the outside host using a host mask? Like only reach the host, or do I need to reach this subnet? And again, the path to the serial zero one. Okay, so they're basically gonna have us do a floating static here. So let me clear the screen and let's do this right here. And let me go ahead and get on to, so we're already on HQ to reach the outside host. Okay, so we're gonna do directly attached. And the primary path is gonna go through the serial 001 interface. All right, so my IP route to get to the 209.165.200.30. Now, here's the question. Is the dot .30 the actual IP of the outside host, or is that indicating the subnet? So how would we figure that? Oops, sorry. How would we figure that out? And this is, let's um, transition here. And then there was our router on a stick conversation. And I'm going to clear this. And let's bring this up here. So we know it's 209.165.200.30. And actually, I need to take a quick look. 200.30 slash 27. So 200.30 slash 27. So I know that the subnet mask, right, and this is our CIDR notation, the classless inter-domain routing notation, right? So I have a slash 27, and what that means is the first 27 bits, 1, 2, 3, 4, dot, 1, 2, 3, 4, 2, 3, 4, Two, three, four, one, two, three, four, wait, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, didn't do that one. Okay. All right, so here's the first 24 bits. We've got eight bits here, and eight bits here, and eight bits here. Now we're borrowing three bits to make these network bits of the last eight bits. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So what we're left with is two to the five in terms of host bits, right? So here's bit one, bit two, bit three, bit four, and bit five for the host bits. So how do I figure out how many usable addresses would be in each subnet in a slash 27? Well, I would take two to the number of remaining host bits minus two. And remember, the minus two is the broadcast address, which is not usable. Remember, we're figuring usables out here and the subnet ID, or the network ID, right? And 2 to the 5 should be 32 minus 2 is 30, right? So that's great. I know that there's 30 usable IPs here, and this guy is dot 30. 
Now, I know that that's not the broadcast address, because what do we know about broadcast addresses? They're always odd, right? The broadcast address is going to always be odd. So what I really need here is I need the block size. And the block size is very simple to figure out. You simply take a look at the borrowed bits, and this will give you the block size. And specifically, you look at the last or the rightmost borrowed bit, and in the octet in which it sits, right, this in this in this use case here with a 209, this will give me, right, if this is 128 and this is 64, this bit position is 32. There's my block size right there. It's that easy. So the first subnet would be 209.165.200.0, right? Because we'll start at 0, but then the block size is 32. So the next subnet would be 32. The next subnet, if we keep with a slash 27s, would be 64. The next subnet would be 96. But with what we're dealing with, what are we interested in here? Because what would be the broadcast address here in this first network? So here's network one, network two, three, I'll draw a little line down here, network four. So here are the four subnets that, again, and there's more subnets. I'm just stopping at four because we're kind of running out of room and we don't need to see everything. So if the network ID of subnet two is 32, my broadcast address must be 31, right? And then the broadcast address here would be 63, and the broadcast address here would be 95. And so when I look at this, what are my usables? Dot one to dot 30. So now the question has been answered. What are the usable IPs, and is that the network identifier that we're looking at here? Or is this the IP address of the host? And we've just answered that question. It's the IP address of the host. There's no question, right? Because we can see that that's a usable IP. So they're kind of walking you into a false sense of security. And I think that's why they pushed it and pushed it so close to the, to the actual boundary here is to get you to look at this because I think what they're trying to get you to do, and let's come back over here, and this is kind of to see if they can get you to take the bait on this, would be to say uh, dot 30 and then to say, 255, 255, 255, and what would a slash 27 be? Well, we know the first three bits are borrowed in the fourth octet, so we would have 128 plus 64 plus 32. So 128 and 64 is 192, and 32 is 224. So they may be trying to get you to do this, right? And this is not what I believe they're looking for. And I don't believe they're looking for the host mask. And we're about to find out here. So what is the network ID for the subnet that this host IP falls in? And again, very kind of tricky here, right? But we saw that. It's 209.165.200.0. Now, we're at 60 out of 82. We're going to quickly learn if this is what they're looking for. And before we do that... Let me, uh, the primary path is going to be serial 010. So we'll do that one there. And do we get any points? We do. We picked up, I think, six points on that. So that is what they're looking for. They're not looking for an all 255 subnet mask with a host designator, right, with, with the dot .30. They're looking for the network in which that outside host sits. And so again, they're looking for you to figure this out, right? To do a little subnetting, okay? All right, so that was definitely one of the more difficult pieces. So serial 010 is the primary, and then 011 with an administrative distance. If I do a question mark here, you can see it says distance metric for this route. This is the administrative distance. So what we have are floating static routes because if this interface goes down, on the HQ router, this route will be installed in the routing table automatically for you, right? So it's like having a backup sitting there, 
just waiting. And so from 66, we maybe go to, and that was an eight pointer right there. So big points on those two pieces. Okay, we're going to configure a directly attached route on R1. A directly attached route on R1. And I'm assuming that they're asking, see again, kind of vague here. So directly attached route to what? And it's got to be the outside host network. So let's come up here to router one, because here's our problem right now. And let's, before we tackle this, let's talk about this. So I'm on router one. What if I say ping 209.165.200.30? Again, that's the IP of the outside host PC. And what we're going to see here is it's not going to work. Now, if you're on a router, and you're running this command, and you see that it doesn't work, let's transition into privilege exec mode from user exec, and I'm going to say show IP route, and you can be specific. I can say, what is the route? If I don't want to see the whole routing table, right, if I don't want to have to fish through this, I can say, show me the route to 209.165.200.0. And I apologize, and you could say, if I'm not mistaken, we can put on the 255, 255, 255, 224, Right? But again, same result, right? As I'm getting back, network not in table. Yeah, it's not in the routing table. So the problem right now is any traffic that shows up on router one, it has no clue how to get to the 209.165. And so therefore, this directly attached default static route here on router one is going to save us. So what we're going to do on router one is we're going to tell router one right now that if any traffic shows up for which you do not have a more specific longer match to get to, in other words, these networks here that are currently in the routing table, if any traffic shows up that doesn't match one of those entries right there, here's what you're going to do with it. You are going to say that my IP route to get to all other networks for which I do not have a longer, more specific match is out my serial 000, zero, zero interface, right? Because this is to be directly connected. Now, this is this an eight pointer? Let's see if this is going to be an eight pointer here and bring us to the 82, and it is. All right, so now let's verify connectivity by making sure that all of the PCs here on the different VLANs, right? Because this will determine whether or not the inner VLAN routing is functioning properly. And so I'm going to test from each of these guys. I'm going to say ping, and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm on PCA. Let me ping, uh, we use PCD, 172.31.88. Everybody's 24, no. Okay. So can I ping over to PCD? Is my inner VLAN routing working going through? the router and fantastic, right? So our, we know our sub interfaces are good, our trunk interface is good. Now can I ping the 209.165.200 dot, uh, what was it, 30. So can I ping out to the internet, right? This 209 address and we can, right? So it's working from PCA, let's check PCB and again, very good chance that it's going to work on all of these guys. And we'll just ping the 209 from here, 165, 200.30. And we've got connectivity, PCC. Ping 209, 165, 200.30. And we're good there. And we'll come back over to the desktop here one last time. Ping 209, 165.200.30. And there you have it. All right. Well, a phenomenal activity. I really like these activities where they have us pull a lot of the knowledge, kind of pool the knowledge that we've acquired to a specific point, and then we're forced to demonstrate our understanding of that knowledge. Now, this was an optional activity this week, but I highly, highly recommend attempting this activity. So that is going to wrap up Packet Tracer Activity 6.4.1.2, which is our Skills Integration Challenge for Chapter 6. All right, guys, thanks so much for watching. Enjoy the snow day. It is still snowing outside. Have a great day, and I will talk with you soon.